Is that Carol King? Okay. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> The reason that I'm scrunched up over here is because for some reason we've just got our, our video to work so that we're on um, the website you can now and, and also on our e-news you can tune in and watch my talks except <laughs> that for some reason it's way off kilter. So this is the center of that. So we're going to have to put up with it for this week until we can figure out what how to fix it. But anyway, good morning. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's really nice to have our daughter Jennifer uh, joining us this Sunday, and I uh, yeah, <laughs> and I really think she and Heather make nice music together. They they seem to really love each other, and they and they love what each other does, and and really are a support for each other. So we're very blessed this week to have to have Jennifer and Heather. Well, our theme this month is living a life that matters, and uh, as I said last week, I have always been drawn to authors and to philosophies that speak to the idea that there is something transcendent that undergirds the material world, um, something that responds to us, something that speaks through our intuition, and, and something that's greater than our world of senses. And, and Louise did such a beautiful job of it this morning, talking about that transcendent piece of us. So I believe that to live a life that matters, our outer accomplishments should be balanced by the inner work that we do to touch this part of us that's not subject to the limitations of the material world. And I don't think that we can truly know what life actually is if we don't have a spiritual belief system that opens us to the depth of our oneness, to our connection, with others and with everything, and that sort of counterbalances the appearances of duality that we live in every single day. So I want to begin with an African story. Um, this, this appeared in Robert Bly's um, book of poetry, The Soul is Here for Its Own Joy. Once upon a time, there was a man who had about 12 cows, and he loved his cows. Every morning and evening, he would praise them for the amount of milk they were giving and praise them for their beauty. One morning, he noticed that the amount of milk had lessened. Each day for a week, he noticed the same thing. So that night, he decided to stay up and see what was going on. About midnight, he happened to look up at the stars and he saw one star that seemed to be getting larger. Well, it was, and the light got stronger as the star came closer and closer to Earth. It came straight down towards his cow pasture and stopped a few feet from him in the form of a great ball of light. Inside the light, there was a luminous woman. As soon as her toes touched the ground, the light disappeared, and she stood there like an ordinary woman. He said to her, Are you the one who's been stealing milk from my cows? <laughs> yes, she said. My sister and I like the milk from your cows very much. He said, You are very beautiful, and I am glad that you like my cows. And so this is what I want to say. If you marry me, we can live together, and I will never hit you, and you won't have to take the care of the cows all by yourself. I will help you take care of them part of the time. So will you marry me? She said slowly, yes, I will. But there's one condition. I've brought this basket with me, and I want you to agree that you will never look into the basket. You must never look into it, no matter how long we are married. Do you agree to that? Oh, I do, he said. So they were married, and they lived together well for six or seven months. <laughs> then one day, while she was herding the cows, he happened to notice the basket standing in the corner of the house. He said to himself, well, you know, she is my wife, so it could be considered to be my basket. After all, this is my house, and the basket is in my house. So it could be considered to be my basket. And after he said this, he opened the basket and then began to laugh. There's nothing in the basket. There's absolutely nothing in it. There's nothing in the basket. 
He kept saying these words and laughing so loudly that his wife heard him. She came into the house and said to him, Have you opened the basket? He began laughing again. I did, he said. I opened the basket, but there's nothing in it. There's absolutely nothing in the basket. She said, I have to leave now. I have to go back. He cried out, Don't go. Don't leave me. She said, I have to go back now. What I brought with me in the basket was spirit. It is so like human beings to think that spirit is nothing. And she was gone. (laughs) Well, most of us here do think that spirit is something or we wouldn't be here. But as I contemplate this little fairy tale, I ask myself, how often do I think that spirit is nothing? And so today that's my question to you as well. How often do you think that spirit is nothing? Because as long as things are going well in our lives, we're fine. God's in his heaven, everything's right with the world. But what happens when life gets messy? What happens when we are diagnosed with an illness or disease? What happens when someone we love disappoints us? What happens when the stock market plummets and we see our financial security threatened? You know, I think if we're truly honest, most of us react with panic or fear, at least at the beginning. Our faith flies out the window, and we regret momentarily, that, and then we forget momentarily that spirit is all there is. And what happens to living the life that matters when our ego seeks top billing? You know, the man praised his cows for their milk and beauty. He loved and respected the woman he married. But the moment he stopped praising, loving, respecting, and started to see through the eyes of ego, me, my, mine, he set the stage for love and joy to leave him. As soon as a woman became my wife, the house, my house, the basket, my basket, he, by and through his own consciousness, created the circumstances that subverted his joy. Now, my topic this morning is the back of the tapestry. And that was inspired by Reverend Dr. Edward Villon of the Santa Rosa Center for Spiritual Living. A tapestry, a tapestry differs from cloth weaving, in which both sides are identifiable. A tapestry is deliberately made so that only one side is discernible. The back is a jumble of threads overlapping, knotted, in some places tangled, broken, or frayed. And one would never know that there's something beautiful on the other side. In his talk, Dr. Edward commented that our life is like a tapestry with each thread contributing to a beautiful, colorful piece of art. But sometimes, when life appears messy, We may be looking at the backside of the tapestry. John Cousins, in his blog called Mood Nudges, asked, Have you ever studied the reverse side of a tapestry? You don't often get the chance, of course, because they're often framed when finished, but now and then you may come across someone working on one. Take a look at the back. Often you kind of work out what's going on on the other side, but generally... The side that's hidden from from our view can be a bit of a mess with hanging threads and tangled stitches. Does this matter? Well, not really. So what of the back then? Should we criticize its messiness? Should we snip off all the hanging threads? Should we somehow try and tidy it up? Well, again, not really. The structure of the tapestry's reverse is what makes the front work so well. It's what gives the work its shape and form. Perhaps there are elements of your own makeup which you may wish were different. Maybe there are episodes in your life that you long to have been able to have handled differently. But, and it's a big but, isn't it those loose threads and uneven stitches which have been instrumental in making you who you are today? Instead of unproductively wishing you could change the unchangeable, maybe there's merit in recognizing their value, celebrating them even. In fact, 
adheres wholeheartedly to the messy background embroidery that's got you to where you are today. It's all part of the two sides of life's rich tapestry. I remember when I was uh, living in Los Angeles, B. Jorgensen was the founder of Friendly House, which was a halfway house for alcoholic women. And I would go to her, I, I became really close friends with her and would go to the meetings and our kids our kids at Founders Church would, would carol for the girls in the, in the house at, at Christmas. And at one of the meetings, she said, you know, I am so grateful for everything that has ever happened to me because there isn't a girl that can come through these doors that I cannot identify with. So as horrific as her life was, it was that strong thread at the back that, that allowed her to be such a beneficial presence to these young women. To live a life that matters, we need to embrace both the shadow and the light. We need to see and give thanks for the blessings in our life that are obvious, but we also need to think about those blessings in disguises, or as my mentor, Reverend Dr. Arthur Chang calls them, God's gems in ugly wrappers. You know? And I think we can all look back over our life and see that so many things that first appeared to be negative, even devastating, have been the catalyst for our growth and for our transformation. What appeared as a jumble of knotted, tangled, frayed, and broken threads now can be seen as necessary to the overall tapestry that is our life, that got us here. So, while we may be looking at the jumbled backside of our tapestry, one of the things that we know is that spirit is continually weaving something magical, mystical, magnificent, and beautiful that is our life. The woman in our African story had to go back, not just because the man opened the basket, but because he saw nothing there. It's so like human beings to think that spirit is nothing. And we certainly can get to that place if we're bogged down in some daily events that aren't taking place the way we would like for them to take place. Our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, says, Spirit flows into everything, through everything. It passes into every human event and translates itself through every human act. If you learn to think of spirit as flowing through your every action, you will soon discover that the things you give your attention to are quickened with new energy, for you are breathing the very essence of being into them. Spirit is essential to a life that matters because our faith in it enables us to see beyond the appearances. We may not know what is ahead, but we can with confidence say to any negative situation, this too shall pass, because we know that's true. We've been there. When we can look at an ugly wrapper and know it contains a gem, a blessing, then we are creating the means for a transformation of that experience. It's only when we keep looking at the wrapper and lamenting it that we're going to keep ourselves in that space. Because sometimes it is that very problem that wakes us up, that makes us see things differently, that sets us on a new path or a new road. Two hurricanes brought me to, to Arizona. I told you that last week. You know, yay, yay for the hurricanes. Yay for the FEMA trailer. You know, it's not something I wanted, but look where it got me. I'm so happy here. <laughs> and sometimes the problems we face make us stronger as we learn that we're really tougher than we thought we were. Khalil Gibran and the prophet says, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. And could, your, and could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. You know, if we stand back, if you look at tapestry, if we stand back and look at them, it is often the darkest threads that set off the brightest ones. 
if we have a tapestry of just bright threads, we may not see it so well. So without this juxtaposition of dark and vibrant, then those threads are lost in the colors with all the other colors. So just as the tapestry needs that darker threads, our life would be less full without those experiences that brought us to our knees and became the fodder for our transformation. Yeah, as a child, I was reading about Oprah Winfrey, and as a child, she experienced abject poverty and horrific abuse at the hands of family members. And she often wore potato sacks because clothing wasn't in the budget. And when she wasn't being abused, she was neglected. She was shuffled between family members, spending her first few years on her grandmother's farm in rural Mississippi while her unwed teenage mother looked for work. And when her grandmother fell ill, six-year-old Winfrey was sent to live with her mother in a Milwaukee boarding house. And there, from ages 9 to 14, she was continually raped by her cousin. When she finally went to live with her father, her life changed as he saw to it that she had both emotional support and an education. And so while she was in high school, she became interested in media, and that set her on a path, and the rest, of course, is history. But I'm wondering, and I haven't found, a, I haven't found where she's actually talked about this, but I wonder if her poverty and abuse weren't contributing factors to her success. Because one of the things I love about Oprah, whether you like her or not, what I love about her is I see genuine compassion in her interviews. And I see honest joy in the success of someone else. And I see this deep sensitivity that she carries with her to every situation. And I think sometimes if we're deprived of a life that has those things, they become more precious when we do find them than if, we had been, if they'd been part of us all along. Author Wayne Dyer says, As I look back at the entire tapestry of my life, I can see from the perspective of the present moment that every aspect of my life was necessary and perfect. Each step eventually led to a higher place, even though these steps often felt like obstacles or painful experiences. If we are seeing our life as jumbled and messy, not going well, I suggest that we take a moment to remember that we don't have the whole picture. It's kind of like it's kind of like coming into to Snow White and 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 seeing seeing her eat the apple, you know, and die, and then we leave. <laughs> we haven't got the whole picture, you know. There is a happy ending. There is something else better out there. So we are seeing. When those things happen, we're seeing the back of the tapestry, and with faith, faith and with patience, we can turn it around. So we need to embrace the mystery and the wonder of it all. The good and the bad, the happy and the sad. Because in doing so, we allow them to pass easily through us. We don't hang on to either one. This too shall pass is for both the good things and the bad things. But in doing that, then we can uncover those gems that have been hidden in ugly wrappers. And it's then that we are living a life that truly matters. Thank you. Namaste. Oh, really.